Thank you all. Good evening. It's a pleasure to present our research today. So as Frank mentioned, over the last four years, we've been conducting several clinical trials looking at the impact of vibration therapy on the muscle and bones of those with muscle skeletal disability. And today I'll be showing briefly the results of our first study in which we look at a group of adolescents with cerebral palsy. Here we go. So for those who are unaware, cerebral palsy is the most common disability in childhood. And we can define it as a disorder of movement and posture due to a static lesion of the developing brain that can happen before, during, or shortly after birth. So it's an insult or an injury on the brain that does not change over time. However, the health outcomes, consequence of it, they do change and they tend to become worse over the years. So the health impact varies and it depends from individual to individual but it's commonly seen that it affects muscle tone, muscle control, and coordination on those kids. And this leads to muscle tightness or spasm over their life, involuntary movements, and also disturbance on their gait and mobility. And that leads to reduction on their muscle mass and also decrease on their muscle strength, which can lead to abnormalities on their bone structure. Therefore, they have an increased risk for bone fractures and it's not only that, they also undergo several surgical procedures over their life. They have Botox therapy, they have tender lengthening, they have bone lengthening, and they all require casting. And if anyone in the audience ever broke a bone, you know that once you cast it and you remove the cast after a period of time, your muscle is quite small in that area, so you have a reduction on your muscle mass. So these children, they are in a cycle of events that doesn't actually optimize the health of their muscle and bones over their life. And unfortunately, there is very limited evidence for effective non-invasive treatments or interventions to help them to improve their bone mass. Therefore, we're trying to see if vibration therapy can assist with that and helping their muscle and their bones in those with cerebral palsy and musculoskeletal disability. So why we're using vibration therapy? Well, it's very easy to use, it's non-invasive, and it has a relatively low cost. The equipment we use costs around 6,000 New Zealand dollars, so it's very expensive for one individual. When you have several of them using it over time, it actually becomes a little bit more cost benefit. Um, and several research over the last 10 years have shown that actually vibration therapy can improve bone mass, can improve muscle mass, and also muscle strength in a diverse range of populations. However, very few studies actually have a look at those with cerebral palsy. And most of these studies, they are very small, or they actually have very difficult methodology, or the interpretation of the results as well make it very hard to understand what was the finding that they obtained. So how does it work, this machine? Well, you stand on it. It is a side alternating plate. So it's a seesaw movement. But it is a very fast movement. It's very fast. And it moves in a very low amplitude. So it's not a huge seesaw. It's a very tiny <coughs> seesaw. And with that movement, you have a little bit of a tilt in your hip during that uh, decline on the plate. It's like when we're walking. It's reciprocating, like copying the movement of walking. And that triggers a contraction on the opposite side that tilted. So all the muscles in that area will contract. So you're constantly contracting, relaxing your muscles without having an idea that you're doing that. So basically it's working with this um, stretch reflex uh, complex that we mentioned. So you're contracting your muscle, you're sending a message to your spine saying, hey, you know, you're losing your balance, contract the other side or else you're gonna fall, and that is doing it in a very small and delicate um, contraction. So the gross motor function classification system, it's a way to define the motor skills of a child. And they're used by doctors and physiotherapists to actually help to identify the needs of that child, not only now, but also for their future care. And because we have a huge range of um, health outcomes with cerebral palsy and skeletal disability, they divide them in a group of five. Our studies, they focus on those with mild to severe cerebral palsy. So they go from level two, three, and four. And the study I'm presenting today for you are those from level two and three. Uh, the inclusion criteria and exclusion varies from study to study, so I won't get on the details to you. But these first initial um, photos on your left, they show participants that are considered level two um, on their gross motor function. 
So our first study uh, was published at the beginning of this year and involved 40 adolescents with mild to moderate cerebral palsy. So the gross motor function uh, two and three. And they have an average of 16 years of age. So very good teenager um, uh, bunch over there. And what was interesting, that, that compliance actually was quite good. They did uh, on overall 74% of their sessions. And we take that to Patricia Cole that was actually making sure that they're doing it all the time. And for teenagers, that's quite good. Uh, the design is simple, it's a one-leg study, so all the participants come, they do their assessments, then they go and take the vibration therapy for the period of time of the study, and then we do the post-assessments on them. They can do the vibration, or they did the vibration at school or at home, and they did that in the specific study for 20 weeks, so approximately five months. And they needed to do it four times a week, each day they could choose. And they need to do it only nine minutes a day of vibration therapy. So we'd stand in this plate for three minutes, rest a little bit, three minutes, rest a bit, three minutes, rest a bit. And the assessments they did included a six minute walk test. Some of you might have done it before. Uh, basically walk between two cones and we measure the distance you walk during that period of time. We also did some body composition scans to see how much muscle mass and bone density they had in different parts of their body. We used a CT scan to look at a little bit more details of their bone health and their muscle health. And we also look at their muscle function on daily activities using a power plate. And we use uh, that to measure the power and force generating activities such as standing from a chair or balancing both feet or maybe trying to jump. And what we saw after 20 weeks or five months, well, we noticed a change in the mobility. But the mobility measured by the six minute walk test. So in this graph, I have in red the results of the initial assessment of the kids, and in blue, their final assessment. And this first graph is the results from the children that were mild, um, considered mild in mobility, so they're actually quite functional, or those on level two. And they improved by the end of the training, approximately 15% on the distance that they achieved at the end. So that was quite remarkable for them without adding anything else to their physiotherapy or care or physical activities. But what impressed us the most was that the group that was actually moderate regarding their motor function had a greater improvement. They improved by approximately 35% their walking distance. So these are children that couldn't even walk to up to 50 meters and now they're walking up to 100 or 150 meters. So that tell us that perhaps those that with more severe disability might benefit the most, but we still need to investigate further. So besides the changes on the six minute walk test, we also notice from our scans that they improve their bone mass and density, and we look at that in areas such as the spine and lower limbs, and also they put it on muscle, approximately 800 grams, so almost a kilo of muscle mass on their body. And also we noticed that they decrease the time required, for example, to stand up from sitting, they are doing that faster and more efficiently, and also the time to walk from A for B. So quite positive results for that specific group which was already quite mobile to start with. But what surprised me the most actually was feedback from families, participants, and physiotherapists. I enjoy hearing from them, the experience, what they were feeling it, and how they were um, enjoying the experience both physiotherapists, the schools, moms and family. I just put it a few of them here, but they were always saying that they could notice the small changes on their daily activities or actually at school uh, functions and training or um, feeling, basically they were feeling a little bit happier as well. Um, and what the future brings, a lot of work, I hope. Uh, we still need to identify what's the most effective protocol to use in this equipment, who actually will benefit the most. Not everybody will benefit the same way. Um, also, when should we start this in this population? We are trying to plan to start next year a study actually starting with kids that are younger as five years old. So we're seeing what's the best age to start. We need to create guidelines for the use of this equipment and also maybe start implementing them on the physiotherapy plans of individuals. So a lot of work coming up. And I wouldn't have done anything of this, and I wouldn't be here working for the last four years if it wasn't for um, the support from the Jubilee Crippled Children Foundation Trust, which have been supporting financially the staff work and the study and also our daily runnings. 
And also, um, I would like to thank the Sir David Levin Foundation. They supported us on buying all the plates we have for the study, and also the power plate. Again, we are very grateful for their support. We wouldn't have done any of these studies without their um, assistance. We are a small group, um, but a very fun one to work with. Uh, we have Professor Paul Hoffman, Miss Patricia Cole, that is always running between schools, driving all around Auckland, and she's really good on keeping the kids on track. Miss Jardine Biggs, that is always helping us with the assessments and behind the scenes. And Josette Reich, that is always helping us with the final writing and summary of our results. But I think the most important people are those actually doing the studies, being involved, their families, the schools, the physiotherapists. Without them, I wouldn't be here. And I think with that, I'll finish my presentation and thank you for your attention.